the differences between what you're seeing in the aging process between like, let's say dogs and humans? There are a lot of ways in which dogs age just like we do. So in humans, mm -hmm. from the age of about our risk of getting diseases and our risk of dying increases exponentially. So risk of, mort risk of dying actually doubles about every eight years. The Dog Aging Project is hoping to recruit 10,000 dogs across the U.S. for the study. Daniel Promislow is working on the project. So Dr. Promislow is a world-renowned expert on aging and has been a researcher in the field for over 30 years. He received a doctorate from Oxford in 1990 as a Rhodes Scholar. Daniel began his career in biology as an undergraduate at U Chicago, got his PhD in evolutionary biology at Oxford, and after some postdocs was a professor first in genetics at the University of Georgia, and for the past nine years now a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and biology at the University of Washington. If dogs are spending time in an air-conditioned house all day more than we are, have you found that it's having a negative effect on their longevity? This is a really interesting question. Uh, we, could, we could spend a whole hour just talking about this. Um, so the idea that a small stress can actually be beneficial when a big stress negative or deleterious. Feeding. So have you found two times a day seems to be safe right now or safer than, you know, one time a day or? The pattern in the paper showed that dogs that feed once a day are also dogs that have fewer of certain kinds of diseases. Hmm. I don't know if you heard it, it kind of reminds me uh, you know, while, while I was doing research, um, reminded me of a story a few years ago. I don't know if you saw in the news where a Florida man kidnapped a scientist and he basically held him hostage so that he could find a way to make his dog be immortal, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, I mean, what reactions do you get? You know, when you tell people, Hey, I help dogs live longer. Like how do people usually react? Well, fortunately, no one has tried to kidnap me. So I, I, and even if they did, I wouldn't, sadly, I wouldn't be able to make anybody's dog live forever. But what we're really trying to do is understand how, what, what are the things that influence whether a dog is a healthy ager? There are dogs that seem to just remain healthy for years and years and others like people who really struggle with with challenges as they get older. And so we're trying to figure out what are the biological factors and the environmental factors that are gonna help all dogs live the healthiest lifespan that they can. So I might not be able to satisfy that Florida man <laughs> and, and, and make his dog live forever, but we hope that in a few years, we'll know a little bit more about how to make all dogs live a little bit healthier longer. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the streets, you know, talking to people about it, are they like, Curious, would you say their reactions are like happy you're doing this because they have dogs themselves? Like, what's oh, yeah. The I, so I, I got to say, I'm that guy who will stop anybody on the street who has a dog and hand them a card about the dog aging project and, and say, you know, hey, have you heard about this nationwide study of aging in dogs? It's open to every dog, no matter how young or how old, how small, how large. And most people, are really excited to hear about it. They want to ask me questions about it. They want to know how they can participate. So it's it's not just about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to learn, but also, you know, we're we're creating this community and people are excited to become part of that community. So um, when when I'm out there in the street talking to people with dogs, they're definitely enthusiastic. I I can count on one hand the number of times people have said, sorry, not interested. Oh wow, really? That's, that's amazing. So, um, you know, you've made quite a name for yourself, uh, researching biology of aging with you know, not only dogs, but also humans. So could you tell the, um, the audience a little bit about the differences between what you're seeing in the aging process between like, let's say dogs and humans? Yeah, well, I have to say we're, we're really just beginning to learn about the difference between dogs and humans. But there are a lot of ways in which dogs age just like we do. So in humans, mm -hmm. from the age of about 20 or so, our risk of getting diseases and our risk of dying increases exponentially. So risk, mm -hmm. of mort risk of dying actually doubles about every eight years as we get older and older. And the same is true in dogs, that pattern of exponential increase in the risk of diseases and of dying. So they show that similar pattern. And they get a lot of the diseases that we do as we age. Um, but there's some 
really interesting differences. So they, dogs get cancer like we do. In fact, dogs are at greater risk of cancer for many breeds than we are. And many of those cancers show that dramatic increase in risk with age. But there are other causes of, of, of mortality that are really tied, with, tied in with aging that we see a lot of in humans and not so much in dogs. So dogs somehow are protected from cardiovascular disease. So they don't have heart attacks, they don't get strokes, they have other heart problems, but they don't get vascular disease. And that's really interesting to us because there's an opportunity there to figure out what protects dogs. And if we can figure out what protects dogs from cardiovascular disease, maybe that will help us understand people as well. One of the things that is really important for your listeners to appreciate is that actually a lot of what goes on in an or individual and an organism as it ages isn't just specific to people or even to dogs. We see some common things that happen, not just in humans and dogs, but even in the really small animals that we study in the laboratory. So I actually have worked on fruit flies in my lab for many years. And there are other people who work on tiny little nematode worms that are about the size of a pencil dot. And a lot of the things that we can measure, even in these tiny little animals at a molecular level, are the same things that are happening in us and in dogs. So there are some kind of universal things that happen with age. But of course, dogs and humans are a lot more similar than humans and fruit flies. So what we learn from dogs is likely to be really good for dogs, help them live healthier longer, and that's good for their owners. But it's also probably going to teach us a lot about human aging. So we're interested not only in understanding how to help dogs live healthier longer, but of course, also how to help people live healthier longer. Mm. So that's really interesting that dogs and humans age pretty similarly. I'm curious, do you think it's because dog, like, has, have dogs always aged similarly to humans or have they, because we kind of like evolved with them, you know, there's some sort of, um, I guess, synergy there? Yeah, that, that's a great question. What, what's really interesting is we see similar patterns, even in wild species, that one of the, the signatures of aging is this increase in mortality, this exponential increase. So in humans, mortality risk doubles in adults about every eight years. In dogs, it's more like about every three or four years. Even in wild species, whether we're looking at elephants or squirrels, all kinds of different species in the wild, in most of them, we see that same pattern. We don't always know why animals die though. And that's one of the really powerful things about studying dogs. So in humans, of course, we have this very powerful healthcare system and we can diagnose diseases. We can determine why it is that someone dies when they die. We don't know that for fruit flies, but we do have a, that same kind of sophisticated healthcare system for dogs. So we can understand why a dog has died, just like why a human has died. My guess is that many of the similarities that we see between people and dogs, we would also see in wild species. Mm -hmm. but, but dogs are really special, not only because they show similar patterns of aging as humans, but also because they live in our environment. There are lots of risk factors in our own environment that influence how we age, things like diet and exercise, but also chemicals in the environment and all, all aspects of the environment can influence how long we live. There are countries where people live for a really long time and other countries where people don't live so long, and that's due to environmental differences between those countries. Mm. Dogs share our environment. and. In many cases, dogs spend more time in our home than we do because we go off to work every day. Mm -hmm. Dogs are there all the time. So there's also an opportunity, not only to understand those biological similarities and differences, but also the environmental factors. And if you think about it, we're, we're interested in drawing a connection between environmental factors 
whether beneficial or deleterious, and their influence on health in dogs. It, we can look in humans, but if there's something that affects us in our childhood, we will have to wait 60, 70, 80 years to understand if that childhood environmental exposure affects aging. Mm -hmm. Because dogs live so much shorter than we do, we can learn so much more quickly about those environmental factors. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe jumping ahead, but that's even something that we're studying on the Dog Aging Project. So we have an environmental core led by a veterinary epidemiologist, Audrey Rupel, and there we're studying things like water quality. We're collecting water samples and measuring mm. what's in water. We often drink bottled water. Dogs are always drinking out of the tap. What is it that they're drinking? How does that impact their health? So all kinds of ways in which um, dogs are really valuable species in which to understand aging, mm -hmm. not just for dogs, but, but also for people. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really exciting. So one thing I've learned, um, you know, listening to uh, leading longevity experts like yourself is that uh, it's actually good for us to have a little physical stress in our life, you know, like just being in an air conditioned room, sitting down all day is actually aging us faster. You know, we need a little stress. I don't know, maybe it's because we evolved to have that, you know, stress being outside all day hunting, um, gathering, you know, uh, running away from predators, you know, so, so for some reason, um, now that we've evolved to a more mo uh, industrialized era, it's having a negative effect on our aging. I'm wondering if dogs are spending time in an air conditioned house all day more than we are, have you found that it's having a negative effect on their longevity because they're also not experiencing a little bit of physical stress as well? This is a really interesting question. Uh, we, could, we could spend a whole hour just talking about this. Um, so the idea that a small stress can actually be beneficial when a big stress is negative or deleterious, uh, we call hormesis, mm -hmm. a hormetic effect. And we don't know a lot about whether that really is going to make people live longer. Mm. We have evidence from lab organisms like the fruit flies that I mentioned before that, that in some cases, small stresses can make them live longer. It's a really interesting question. And there might even be ways that we can study that in the dog. A lot of these ideas are untested in organisms living in the real world, like people and dogs, because we live for a long time and it's really hard to measure some small stress early in life and then follow us for 50 years. There are studies that are doing that, um, following cohorts of people for their whole lives, but it's hard. So with the dogs, it's, it's certainly something that we can look at for, not for all the dogs in our study, which right now is about 45,000, mm -hmm. but for a subset of those dogs, about a thousand, um, we have funding to collect biological specimens every year from those dogs. Blood products, hair, urine samples, fecal samples. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is measuring elements in those samples that we might think of as stressors. So we have a, a collaborator, for example, who works on heavy metal toxins. And there might be, so you can imagine, there are some heavy metals where no matter how little the quantity that an organism ingests, it's deleterious. So there's no level that might be beneficial. But there might be some molecules, some features that we'll measure where we'll say, where we'll find that dogs that have a little bit in the long run do better than dogs that have a lot or even that have none at all. So this is, I guess, a long, a long winded way of saying, I don't have an answer to your question yet, but it's a really interesting question. And I think we can answer it with the kinds of studies like we do where we're tracking individuals over their whole lives. And we can go back and look for evidence of those stressors early in life. So 
one thing that people commonly measure in, in both people and dogs are some hormones that are indicative of being a little stressed. Mm -hmm. And we might find that a little stress is actually a good thing. And if, if we, a few years from now, when we've tracked dogs for long enough and we can look back at the samples and see how they did over time, if we find that that's true, you're the first one I'll call. Right. <laughs> That'd be exciting to hear. <laughs> so um, speaking about exciting, I mean, have you made any exciting or maybe even surprising discoveries um, you know, during your research so far with the dog aging project? Um, so we're now a few years into the data collection and we've been doing a lot of work so far on the first year of data. And we've, we've found some really interesting things. Um, I should mention that uh, I am one of about a hundred people who's working on this project. And so I don't do all the research myself. Um, I'm helping bring all the people together. And then we have this brilliant team of people who are doing all kinds of cool things. So for example, um, there's a study that we published um, looking at patterns of feeding and how that's associated with health in dogs. Hmm. So we know, for example, that some dogs are fed just once a day, give them all their food and they eat it all up and then they get their next meal the next day. Others are given two meals a day. And then there are some dogs, and I've certainly had dogs like this, where you leave the food out and they might nibble at a, a little bit. Some days they might not eat anything and some days they'll eat a little bit through the day. It turns out that there are differences in the frequency of certain diseases in dogs that feed once a day versus multiple times a day. Hmm. So for example, dogs that feed once a day are less likely to be diagnosed with pancreas problems. So that the question then is why, what, what's causing what? And here's where we don't yet know. So in our first year of data, we have a lot of information about feeding behavior. We have a lot of information about health, but we don't know why they might be related. Hmm. Um, so we don't know if feeding once a day makes you healthier or maybe it's the opposite. So for example, I had a dog it's no longer with us who had pancreas problems. And after she was diagnosed with pancreatitis, the veterinarian said that we should feed her many small meals a day. So if that happens, feeding more frequently would be associated with pancreatitis because in a sense, being diagnosed with pancreatitis caused the dog to be given multiple meals a day. The, mm. So we don't know yet which causes which. The cool thing is, because we have now three years of data and every year we're getting more and more data, we'll soon be able to start going back to the first year of data and comparing feeding behavior, for example, among dogs that are all healthy and then looking at what happened four or five years in the future. And then we can begin to draw these causal arrows. Um, another cool study that just came out um, looked at the social environment of dogs. And we found, for example, that uh, dogs that live in homes with other dogs tend to be healthier. Hmm. We don't yet know why, but it's a really interesting observation. Um, in my own lab, we study the metabolome. The metabolome consists as a, uh, we, we take blood products, plasma, and we measure uh, many small molecules that are found in many organisms. You think about sugars and amino acids and um, the, the chemicals that make up all of life, the building blocks. Those are metabolites, those small chemicals. And we can measure hundreds of them in dogs or people or even in fruit flies. In my lab, we have found that we can actually predict how old a dog is based on the measure of those molecules. What we're really interested in finding out, and this is still a couple of years away, is whether from that small blood sample, which is really a, just a drop of blood, can we also predict certain diseases that either a dog currently has or is at higher risk of getting in the future? So 
that's not yet published, but that's something that, that we're excited to be working on. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of papers are coming out from the first year of data, and we're now moving into analyzing longitudinal data, tracking what happens to dogs over time. Uh, mm. And if, if your listeners are interested in learning more, they can go to our website, which is dogagingproject.org, all one word, dogagingproject. And we actually, actually have a list there of all the papers that have come out that talk about the various findings from our studies. Awesome. And we'll put that in the show notes. So I do want to unpack, you know, some of the discoveries you talked about. So let's start with the feeding, like times of feed. So have you found an optimal time yet? Like two times a day seems to be safe right now or safer than, you know, one time a day or. Well, so what, what the, the pattern in the paper showed that Dogs that feed once a day are also dogs that have fewer of certain kinds of diseases. Mm. But we don't know from, from that analysis, because it's what we call a cross-sectional analysis, it's just a slice in time of all the dogs of all ages and all health, all levels of health. We don't know which is ca causing which. Mm. So we're pretty confident that feeding your dog twice a day or once a day, or even multiple times a day, if your dog is a dog that doesn't eat all its food at once, is fine. The one thing that we do know is, problem, is a problem for dogs is feeding too much. So mm -hmm. just like in people, being overweight in a dog is associated with increased health risks of all kinds. Mm -hmm. So in, in humans, we talk about a body mass index, and if people go to their their healthcare provider, they might say, your body mass index is too low or too high, here's the optimal range. In dogs, we talk about a body condition score that a veterinarian can give a dog. And similarly, there's too thin, too fat, we want a sort of Goldilocks happy medium. So that, that's something that we do know a lot about, being a healthy weight is important. And, in a few years, once we've been able to track these dogs over time, the ones that feed once a day, twice a day, throughout the day, we might be able then to determine whether there are health consequences of different feeding behavior. We also know, and this is something that, that we're working on, there, there is a genetic basis to feeding behavior. So there are actually genes in dogs that determine whether they're voracious eaters or they don't care much about food, whether there are certain kinds of food that they really wanna eat. And so it's also possible that the genetic basis of feeding behavior is related to certain uh, behavior, other behaviors or disease risks, and that might tie them together. So the, the exciting thing about, this is still early days. So I'll, I'll work with you to try and unpack some of these things, but it's challenging because it's such early days. But as we move into this longitudinal phase, when we're at you know five, six, seven years in, we will be able to really unpack in a meaningful way how early life behavior, lifestyle, environment, genetics influences that long-term trajectory of, of your pet dog. Right, exactly. So uh, this is kind of like a little off topic, but you know how Americans, right? There's uh, about two thirds of Americans are overweight. And so do, you, do we have data on how many dogs are overweight in the whole dog population in the US? Um, we're working on that in our own population that we're studying of, of 45,000 dogs. Um, there, there might be some statistics that I'm not familiar with, there are some data suggesting that uh, people who are overweight are more likely to have a dog that's overweight. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and it's certainly a, a problem. Veterinarians will tell you that, that when they see a dog that's overweight, they will encourage the owner to try and, and have the dog lose some weight. Um, and 
some people, uh, you know, it depends on the human not giving as much food or certain kinds of food to the dog. But many people will tell you that you know, the dog looks up at you with those puppy dog eyes <laughs> begging for food. And for some people, it's very hard to say no. Right. Exactly. Yeah. My dog's like that with uh, carrots. <laughs> carrots. That's a pretty healthy snack for a dog. Yeah, definitely. Carrots and uh, French fries. Fortunately, we don't. We Not don't such a healthy that. snack for a dog. Yeah, we don't give a. Uh, we don't give her human food. Um, so okay, yeah, that's interesting, and that kind of makes sense because, you know, kids that have overweight parents are also more likely to be overweight, and so humans kind of see dogs as kind of like part of the family, you know, so if you have an overweight right. person, they kind of see that dog as a son or a daughter, you know, like an extended son or daughter. So they're more likely to feed. So the, yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. And uh, let's talk about social connection. So, I mean, with humans, right, I think it's kind of, you know, evident now that people who are more socially connected are likely to more likely to live longer. And so are we able to like draw some inferences like, hey, what's working for humans? It might also work for dogs as well, you know, with with longevity. Yeah, I, I think we will eventually be able to do that. Um, for now, we just have these interesting observations that lead us to want to design new experiments or new questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we find that Dogs that are living in homes with other dogs tend to be healthier. Interestingly, dogs that are living in houses with kids uh, tend to be less healthy. Hmm. And um, we don't know why. One possibility is that um, people who have both kids and dogs will prioritize taking a child to a healthcare worker before they'll take the dog to the vet if they have to choose between the two. So maybe dogs in homes with kids are less likely to be taken to the vet. We mm. don't know. Um, the, the social interaction with other dogs is really interesting. And um, because of all the molecular biology that we're doing, one of the things that we're excited about is to see when we find correlations like that, can we use our molecular biology to tease apart the mechanisms that might be driving that? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're we're asking about now um at this point it's it's just an observation that leads us to then try to figure out well what's what's the next best question that we can ask to try and tease this apart a little more to try and figure out well why is it that dogs that live in homes with other dogs tend to be healthier longer i i can tell you we we have a dog in our home and most of the time he's by himself but when our daughter brings over her dog, our dog is the happiest dog in the world. Mm. And he's a pretty, pretty anxious dog. Um, but when our daughter's dog is around, he just seems to lose all of his anxiety and seems to be really happy and healthy. And, and so it's easy to imagine that for our dog, if another dog that he liked a lot was always around, he would be a lot more active. He'd be less likely to hide under the bed, which he likes to do. He's a very anxious dog. Um, so I could easily imagine why he would be healthier if he had another dog around. Does that kind of make you want to get another dog? <laughs> it certainly makes my wife want to get another dog. <laughs> <laughs> make me want to second guess. You know, my wife talked about it quite a few years ago about, oh, we should have another dog. That was when it was just, our dog. And now, you know, fast forward, we have two kids or, you know, now she's not talking about it anymore. <laughs> we've got our hands full. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, yeah, that might, you know, you're kind of persuading me to get another dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's interesting. Uh, one thing I'm thinking about is the impact genes have, um, that influences you know, longevity. So have you found like, let's say a link between genes influencing aging um, that, you know, the public should know about whether it be in dogs, but also humans? Yeah. So this is a, a really important question. And it, 
it's a really important topic for the dog aging project. Um, I think of the, the overarching goal as the project is to understand how genes and environment shape healthy aging. And in fact, we have a whole team of people who I met with yesterday who are dedicating their effort to finding genetic signatures of healthy aging and behavior in our dogs. And um, it's, it's pretty early days. We have, so far we have about 7,000 whole genome sequences from the dogs in our study out of 45,000. Um, that seems like a large number, but to identify genes that influence a complex trait like lifespan um, is really hard because there are probably hundreds or thousands of genes that play a role, each of which has a very small effect. To tease apart that effect, you need a very large sample size. So I will say 7,000 is a great start, but we want to get just as high as we can in terms of numbers of dogs sequenced. Um, so there's one thing that is really obvious to that we've known for a long time. And that is that larger dogs, large breed dogs, tend to be much, tend to be much shorter lived than small breed dogs. And the size is determined by genes. So we know that there's some connection right there between genetics and lifespan. We don't know what it is. So we know a lot about the genetics of size. And in fact, there are lots of genes that contribute to size in dogs, just like in people. But there's one gene in dogs that seems to play an outsized role in determining whether a dog is going to be the size of a little dachshund or chihuahua or an Irish wolfhound or a Great Dane on the other end. And that's a gene called insulin growth factor one or IGF-1. Previous studies from mice, for example, have shown that IGF-1 is associated with aging, with longevity. There's some suggestion in humans that it might be associated with age-related disease. We don't know yet whether that is the gene that explains why large breed dogs are so much shorter lived than small breed dogs, but we're certainly asking. Um, so it's, it's early days. Um, I had a very exciting meeting yesterday where, with the genetics team where they were telling me about some of their early findings on the genetics of behavior. These are data not yet published, but they'll start writing them up. So um, I would say sometime in 2024, we'll start seeing papers coming out from the Dog Aging Project about the genetics of all of the traits that we're measuring. And I, I should say we're measuring hundreds and hundreds of different things in every dog. So I'm pretty excited about the work that that team is going to be doing. Yeah, that is that is really exciting. That's just what a year from now. So yeah, um, um, one thing that I will share that we've already shown from earlier studies is that mixed breed dogs tend to be longer lived than purebred dogs. And on average, about a year longer for a given size. So hmm. we know that the larger the dog is, the longer lived, it, the shorter lived it's going to be. And in fact, the sweet spot seems to be around 20 pounds. Hmm. This isn't to say that people should go out and get a dog based on how long it's going to live. There are people who love those giant breed dogs and they know they're not going to live as long as the toy breeds, but those are the breeds they love. And if you have a strong connection with those kinds of dogs, that's great. That's the dog kind of dog you should get. We do know that the purebred dogs won't live as long as mixed breed dogs on average. Mm. Of course, that's just average. That every dog is unique. Um, ultimately, though, we hope to be able to identify those things that will make all those dogs at least stay a little healthier longer. Mm, wow. That's really interesting that mixed breed dogs live longer. Yeah, wow. and it's, it's not surprising. We know, we've known for a long time that there's a cost to inbreeding. Um, even in humans, if you look at the pedigrees of royal families from two, three hundred years ago, where there was a lot of inbreeding in Spain, for example, mm. um, and in other parts of Europe, um, there were some pretty high rates of certain diseases that are genetic and associated um, with inbreeding, like hemophilia uh, and um, 
So inbreeding is not a good thing in general. Right. Um, and even in, in purebred dogs, uh, breed clubs really try hard to keep the breed genetically healthy. Mm. Um, and sometimes inbreeding can lead to uh, an increase in frequency of a particular allele, a particular kind of gene that is associated with disease. And breed clubs really want to try and prevent that from happening. So purebreds tend to be more inbred than mixed breeds, but there are also things that we can do to keep them healthy. Right. Absolutely. So you mentioned that, you know, it's going to take a few more years. Let's just fast forward, you know, say 10 years. What uh, exciting advancements do you just anticipate will make, you know, um, related to longevity in, let's, let's start with dogs and then we'll start with humans as well. Sure. Uh, so from the Dog Aging Project, my hope is that certainly 10 years from now, we will have a really good understanding of how all kinds of lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, social setting, and so on, influence disease risk and healthy lifespan in dogs. Um, we'll have a pretty good understanding of how those behaviors influence, different behaviors influence aging. And we'll be able to help dog owners make choices that will help their dogs live the healthiest possible lifespan. And not only will we know those things, but we'll know why those connections are there. We'll know, for example, if, if we find that there are particularly, particular kinds of diet that are linked to having a really healthy lifespan, we'll also know why. What are the molecular or genetic factors that are kind of the bridge linking the diet and health? Um, and at the level of those molecular factors, I my hope is that we will also have uh, what we call a precision medicine for dogs. Mm -hmm. So in humans, we talk about precision medicine as a way of, first of all, recognizing that every human being is unique. And so if you have some problem, you go to the doctor, you have even to, you know, a cold or whatever, some disease, you go to the doctor that in a precision medicine context, the doctor might be able to say, given your genetic background or given your biochemistry, here's the drug that's going to work well for you. Here's the dose that's going to work well for you. And, and maybe even here's the diet that's going to be best for you. So part of what we're doing is trying to develop a kind of precision medicine for dogs so that veterinarians can use some, what we hope will someday be simple molecular tools that will be in a box on the counter in a, in a veterinary clinic and be able to not only diagnose the dog when it comes in, but also to choose the best treatment for that dog based on the molecular discoveries that we and other scientists and veterinarians working on these problems will have made 10 years from now. And I think that the same will be true for, for humans, that we will go into the doctor's office and there will be some simple tests that they can run on a drop of blood in the, in the clinic that will be able to diagnose disease, to predict future disease, to choose best course of treatment and prognosis, and, and ultimately the best uh, behaviors and diets and so on that will prevent those diseases in the future. So that's, that's my, my big dream. Um, many of my colleagues in the aging field are looking for a drug that's going to make people live healthier longer. It's not something that I work on. Um, what I'm really interested in is how to maximize our healthy lifespan by doing things that we already know about. Um, so you mentioned, for example, high rates of, of obesity in this country, and that's associated with high rates of diabetes and other problems. And if we can find ways to help people maintain a healthy body weight, 
that's going to have a big impact on health span in this country. And I think the same is true, going to be true for dogs. So what are the things that we can do around diet, exercise, social interactions, healthy sleep, all those sorts of things that we already know about. The challenge is how to change behaviors for people as well as for dogs. Um, and also to identify other environmental factors. We know, for example, that there are states in the United States where the average lifespan or health span is three, four, five years longer than other states. How can we make all the states be like the, long, the, the states that have the longest health span? Mm. Uh, so that's my kind of big picture goal that 10 years from now, we'll know, we will know what those factors are that make both people and dogs the healthiest they can be, and we'll have good strategies for implementing those factors. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you know, your dream is to really have all of the U.S., not just you know particular states, really live longer. Um, so what do I you would think? Say live healthier longer. Live healthier longer. Yes, absolutely. Lifespan, health span. Um, so from a social perspective, like. What do you think the implications would be if humans and dogs lived a longer and healthier life? Great question. And it's, it's something that I think a lot about. Um, what would the world look like? What would our country look like if people were really, even if we didn't make people live longer, but if everybody was functionally healthier longer, what, what are the implications? And um, I think it's a really important question and one that we don't ask often enough. I go to lots of aging meetings where we talk about the biology of aging, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about this question. And I'm, I'm really glad that you asked it. I think it's such an important question. There are obvious good things about it for people who are um, in their later years and living with chronic health conditions that can be extremely difficult. And if we could reduce either the incidence or the severity, the challenges of those chronic health conditions, that would be great. But then there are other questions that arise. So for example, right now I'm working with some colleagues on a project thinking about how long people work for. So right now in this country, we typically have retirement age of 65. Um, if you, uh, if we are able to find a way to ensure that people can live healthier for a decade longer than they currently do and are totally functionally capable of still working, um, what, what do we, what does that world look like? Um, if people want to continue working, are there systems that we should put in place to enable them to do that. Um, you know, people retire with an idea that they're not gonna live for another 50 years, but what about if they don't wanna retire because they're living healthier longer? What do we do about that? Should we create systems in place for that? At the same time, how do we ensure some equity so that it's not just the people who can't afford not to work, who have to work longer? But we have a world where at 65, people who want to choose to continue to work can do so. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. And there are certainly corporations that actively seek out older individuals to work for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are stores where you can go and you see that older individuals have, being, have been hired there um, for positions that are great given their functional capacities. Um, there are economic issues. I'm not an economist, but certainly if people are living longer, there are issues about social security, for example. Um, and as people live healthier longer, there might be interesting changes in family structures. Um, there are some cultures where people very often live in multi-generational houses. Um, we see less of that in this country. 
as people live longer, might that shift? Might the, the structure of families begin to shift? So the, these are questions uh, on topics for which I have no expertise. Um, so I don't, I, I can't contribute to the answers, but I'm excited to help try to bring people together in the same room to begin to really think hard about, about these questions. And um, you know, I don't know if my colleagues who are working on this are going to have a pill that people can take once and their health span is going to increase 10 years. But if they did, and we suddenly saw that, that would have not only big biological implications, but big social, economic, philosophical, cultural implications. And so I think it's a really interesting time to, to be thinking about these things. Um, one last point I'll make. When I began working in aging, which is back in the late 80s, early 90s, I remember going to meetings where people were just beginning to make discoveries about genes that could dramatically increase lifespan in nematode worms. And people would say, you know, and we hope that someday these discoveries might help us take a product to the clinic, to clinical trials. There are now many clinical trials motivated directly by discoveries from geroscience. People are testing drugs to see uh, if not they, if not, if not to, do, to make people live longer, which would be a very long study, at least to improve healthy aging. And so, so the time has arrived where people are studying aging in clinical trials in people as well as in dogs. And so I think it's a really good time to begin these other conversations about, well, what if we're successful in that endeavor? What are the other implications? And are there things that we should be doing now to plan for those potential implications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really exciting times. I mean, we really don't know what's possible at this point. And you know, I heard from someone else, they, I forgot who was it, but they said, uh, the biggest thing you can do right now is don't die because as technology is um, exponentially speeding up, you just want to be on that curve with technology. So that way, you know, you can live longer at the pace that technology goes. And if you die, then, you know, you can lose out on that. So, you know, we, we really don't know where the future, what the future holds related to this because technology is with AI now, nanotechnology. I mean, it's, it's really exciting times. It, it is. I, I would reassure your listeners that um, we also know more than ever, we know a lot about how to stay healthy now. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are, we, we could worry about the future and whether we're going to get there or not, but there are things that we can do now that will maximize our enjoyment of life right now that might also help us stay healthier longer. Healthy diet exercise, healthy sleep patterns, social interactions. We know all of those things help us be healthier now and enjoy life now, as well as probably improving our health span as well. Absolutely. And let's break that down. You know, let's talk about practical tips, you know, for people. So, you know, uh, we'll break it down with dogs and then also, um, you know, what the research says with humans. But what are some practical tips, you know, uh, related to, you know, you mentioned diet, uh, sleep, exercise. So can you talk about maybe like the optimal sort of um, realm people should be in related to each one of those categories? Let me preface this by saying I'm, I'm not a veterinarian and mm -hmm. I, so I, I can't give veterinary advice. And, and so I really speak just as a dog owner and, um, and someone who reads the literature. And, and I think the, the simplest things that um, we can do are to help our dogs maintain a healthy body weight. And if you're not sure what that is, ask your veterinarian what the optimal weight for your dog is and do what you can to help your dog maintain that weight. It really, there, there are some dogs that will just naturally eat as much as they want, and that turns out to be enough to keep them at their optimal body weight. If, if you have a dog that will eat as much as you give it, it's really important for you to be very conscientious about 
helping your dog to, to keep a healthy weight. And then the, the second most important thing I would say is exercise. And um, different kinds of dogs need different intensities of exercise. But the great thing about exercising your dog is that it's also an opportunity to exercise yourself. And whether that's, um, there's some people who will go run with their dogs. There's some people who have a dog that can't walk and they'll carry it around um, outside. Um, but I think those are really the, the two big things, healthy, uh, uh, healthy weight and, and exercise. Um, a lot of people ask about what kind of food they should feed their dog. And that's something um, about which I don't have exercise. There are veterinary nutritionists um, who know a lot about that, but I'm not one of them. Uh, so I will stay away from that debate. Um, but certainly um, healthy weight, exercise um, are both good. And then keep in mind that um, every breed has its own risk factors. You were asking me earlier about genetics and um, one of my co-founders, our chief veterinary officer, Dr. Kate Creevy, likes to tell her students that when a purebred dog comes into the clinic, the first thing you do is a genetic test with your eyes. Mm -hmm. You look at the dog and if the dog has a particular complaint and it's a chihuahua or a golden retriever, your diagnosis might be very different because they're at very different risks of different diseases. And so it's also really valuable if you know what kind of dog you have to ask your veterinarian, what are the kinds of diseases that my dog is at risk of? And, and your veterinarian may have really good advice for how to help your dog, how to protect your dog from those diseases or how to treat your dog if it's suffering from one of those diseases that's particular to that kind of breed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you say exercise, you know, I know that every breed needs different intensities. So what's kind of like the bare minimum? Like, do they need to walk for like, you know, 30, 30 minutes a day? Like what's, what should they at least get um, in exercise daily? Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, so I, I don't have a well-founded opinion. And so I won't say what I can tell you from our own uh, studies, and we've written papers about this, is that um, as dogs get older, um, they tend to exercise less. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly anecdotally found that in my own dogs that the optimal amount of time and the optimum intensity is going to change as your dog ages. It's mm -hmm. very natural as your dog gets older to want to uh, not walk or run as fast and not as long. And you can respect um, you know, what your dog is telling you. Um, so the younger dogs are, are going to uh, be capable of exercising more and, and might want more exercise. Um, it's also complicated because the, the answer of how long to exercise your dog and how intensely is really gonna depend on the breed of dog. Um, there are some dogs that are relatively exercise intolerant, the, the flat-faced dogs or brachycephalic dogs. Um, some of them have breathing problems and if you exercise them too intensely, that you could run into problems. So it really de depends on the dog. The best thing you can do um, all of your listeners, um, is to consult your veterinarian. Um, they are the experts, um, not only in the field, but they're the experts about your dog. Um, so if they've had a chance to get to know your dog, they will be able to tell you what the best things are to do for your individual dog. Absolutely. So similarly, um, can you share maybe like practical tips that, uh, humans based on the research, what people can do to, uh, enhance their longevity? Uh, certainly being a healthy weight um, is uh, number one. Um, and we know from research that exercise um, helps people live healthier longer. Um, and it doesn't have to be intense exercise. Um, 
You don't have to be a marathon runner. Just going for a walk every day is better than not going for a walk every day. Um, something to consider though that, that is important as we get older into our 50s, 60s, 70s is that in addition to exercise, whether it's walking or swimming or biking, whatever you like to do, that um, doing some resistance training is also really valuable. As we get older, we begin naturally to lose muscle mass in a process called sarcopenia. That just means the, the loss of muscle mass. And we can reduce the effects of that through resistance training. And if that's something that your listeners are interested in, I would say speak with a, your physician for sure to make sure that it's okay for you to start an exercise program if you haven't already, and then um, begin something that, that uh, gives you both opportunity to get your heart rate up a little bit, walking, jogging, running, swimming, biking, um, whatever you like to do. Um, and then, um, and maybe some, some resistance training as well. Um, I'm not an exercise specialist. There are, uh, there's a lot of work being done now on, <clears throat> excuse me, on high intensity training. Um, so that's something that I don't have an opinion about, but your listeners might want to look into that. Um, and maintaining a healthy diet. There are so many different kinds of diets around the world. There are cultures around the world that eat all kinds of different foods. Um, and I'm not here to say what, that, what the healthiest diet is. We do know that there are certain parts of the world where people seem to live a particularly long time um, and diet might be associated with that. There's a lot of interest in the Mediterranean diet. Um, there's an interest in uh, people who live in a particular region in Japan, uh, they eat a lot of fish. Um, I don't know what the optimal diet is, but certainly maintaining healthy weight, whatever your diet, um, is going to be really valuable. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also know that healthy sleep patterns are really important. As we get older, for many of us, it becomes harder to sleep as long uh, or as easily. Um, but if there are things that you can do to help yourself get a good night's sleep um, as often as possible for the rest of your life, that's good for aging. And then the last thing um, is that people who have more social interactions tend to be healthier longer. Um, I don't know what the sweet spot is. Um, how many friends is the right number of friends, but certainly having some old social interaction, getting out and doing things with people um, also appears to be associated with a, a healthy uh, lifespan. Awesome. So I know we covered a lot today. Um, what is, like if you had to summarize, what is one thing you want people to walk away from from this conversation uh, related to aging and longevity? So uh, the first thing I would say is, if you're interested in aging and you have a dog, whether it's a puppy or a really geriatric dog or anything in between, purebred, mixed breed, male, female, anywhere in the United States, please sign them up at dogagingproject.org. Doesn't cost anything. And all of what you share with us will go towards science to help us understand how to ensure that all dogs are healthy agers. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that we, there are things that we can do starting today to help ourselves live the healthiest possible lifespan, diet, exercise, sleep, social interaction. And uh, we don't need to wait for that magic pill that may or may not be discovered sometime in the future. Um, but even today, there are things that we can do to help everybody in our country and around the world, um, live the healthiest possible lifestyle. Awesome. Well said. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Promislo, for making time to uh, really join us in this conversation today. And where can people find you? Um, so they can find me at dogagingproject.org. If you'd like to reach out, um, there's a button, a contact us button. And if you send me a note, it will uh, be sent to me. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Awesome. 
All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Um, I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Really appreciated it.